Thanks, Colleen. All right, I see the list of participants is getting relatively stable. Let's um, get started. Thank you all for joining today's uh, Geospatial Fellows webinar. I'm Xiao Wen Wang from uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm serving as the PI for the Geospatial Software Institute conceptualization project supported by the National Science Foundation. This uh, NSF project organizes this Geospatial Fellows webinar series in partnership with AAG, UCGIS, OGC, NORC at the University of Chicago and uh, UIUC's CyberGS Center for Advanced Digital and uh, Spatial Studies. I wanna extend many thanks to um, several colleagues who have been helping running this uh, Geospatial Fellows webinar series, in particular, Dr. Colin Doney at uh, AAG, and uh, July T at AAG as well. And my um, UIUC colleague, Dr. Alan Padamnaben at the CyberGS Center and uh, Becky Van der Wally uh, at UIUC um, working with me as a PhD student. Now I'm very uh, delighted to introduce today's speakers. Uh, we have uh, two uh, fantastic speakers today. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Naomi uh, Lazarus, who is Assistant Professor of Geosciences in the Department of Geography and Planning at uh, California State University, Chico. Dr. Lazarus' uh, research examines the demographic, social, and economic impacts of disasters and hazards. She incorporates spatial statistics and the GIS to assess vulnerability and the risk associated with uh, environmental hazards and uh, disease epidemics. Her presentation today is titled Examining the Causal Effects of Age and Underlying Conditions on COVID-19 Incidents and Mortality. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Kenan Li, who is a research scientist in the Spatial Sciences Institute of the University of Southern California. Dr. Li's research interests focus on spatial computation and modeling of community resilience and sustainability data science and statistics in environmental health and the uh, geosimulation of human and uh, environmental systems. Dr. Li's 
presentation today is titled Social Determinants of Human Mobility Change Patterns and Their Impacts on Mortality and Food Insecurity. So both talks are very interesting and highly related. So um, now I'm gonna pass the Zoom floor to uh, Dr. Naomi Lazarus to uh, give her talk. Thank you, Naomi. Please take it away. Naomi, you're muted. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Naomi Lazarus, and my presentation today is going to be looking at the effects of age and underlying conditions on COVID-19 incidence and mortality. My presentation will focus on data management uh, methodology. I'll share with you some of the results and also the steps that I'm taking to make this work reproducible. So some background, the CDC highlights that um, the elderly population is at much higher risk of uh, contracting and dying from COVID-19. Um, they highlight that adults age 65 to 74 are 40 times more likely to be hospitalized. And from those who are hospitalized, um, are 1,300 times more likely to die from the virus compared to the comparison group of 15 to 17 year olds. This uh, number drastically increases for the 85 plus age cohort, uh, where they are 95 times more likely to be hospitalized and 8,700 times more likely to be uh, um, to experience uh, negative outcomes uh, compared to the comparison group of 15 to 17 year olds. Other studies have also highlighted that, highlighted that in addition to the direct impacts from COVID-19, the elderly are also subject to social isolation and mental health issues that can drastically increase their uh, risk of infection and death from COVID-19. Underlying medical conditions increase the risk of illness from COVID-19, and the CDC lists several uh, comorbidities like heart disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, chronic kidney disease that can increase the risk of illness from the virus. International studies have also highlighted this phenomena, uh, particularly the one by Novasid and others looks at a comparative analysis between uh, people in India and the UK and found that in India, particularly uh, high diabetes prevalence and respiratory, respiratory illnesses will increase the risk of COVID-19 infection and death compared to other comorbidities that were found in the United Kingdom. For this project, I'm conducting an exploratory analysis of county level effects of age and comorbidity as they relate to COVID-19. The age cohort variables that I'm using are 50 to 74 year olds and the above 75 age category. The comorbidities that are going to be highlighted are diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. I'm conducting this analysis using a geographically weighted regression. The, this table uh, lists the independent variables that I will be analyzing. The age cohort variables are extracted from the American Community Survey. The comorbidity variables are taken from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system that is maintained by the CDC. They have different data sets that address different comorbidities, and I access the data from that website. The dependent variables uh, begin with looking at raw case and death counts that were obtained from usfx.org. This website monitors daily deaths and case counts starting from the early part of 2020. Uh, one of the criticisms of using raw case numbers is, that, as pointed out by Pierce and others, is that the quality of data can be compromised and it can be misleading, especially when you're looking at data at different scales. The CDC suggests different measures of morbidity and mortality instead of raw case numbers. So, for example, some measures of morbidity include incidence rates, incidence proportion, point prevalence, uh, some measures of mortality are crude death rate, cost-specific death rate, 
debt to case ratios. And so for this research, I'm looking at incidence rates, which is calculated by dividing the number of new cases during a specific time period by the total county population per 100,000. And the second dependent variable is debt to case ratios. Uh, that is looking at the number of new deaths during a specific time period divided by new cases during that same time period per 100. The time period here is I'm looking at two peak periods that occurred during the early part of the pandemic. So the first peak uh, occurred between March 1st and April 30th, and the second peak between June 1st and July 31st. So um, a lot of the data compilation was driven by the conditions placed by the GWR model. One of those conditions is that skewness can be an issue when running a GWR, as well as, as, well as missing and zero values. So if uh, there are features with missing and zero values, the model will automatically drop those features from the analysis. So in order to address these issues, uh, the dependent variable was log transform to address skewness. And also the features with uh, zero and missing values were removed. Um, other considerations relating to privacy had to do with the data on underlying conditions where there are stipulations where we cannot use data for counties that have lower than 10 counts. So those counties were also eliminated from the, from the analysis. So based on all of these modifications, I ended up with four data sets. Each data set addresses a single dependent variable for that specific peak period. So for example, if you look at the second row of information, that is the data for incidence rates for the second peak period, and the sample size there was around 3,000 features. And in the last row, you will see that this is the data for debt to case ratios for that peak period two, and the sample size was around 1,964 features. The methodology that is being used here is a geographically weighted regression model, which is a model that addresses spatial dependency and is rooted in Tobler's first law of geography that talks about the distance decay effect. Uh, it states that mere features are more influential and related to each other than features that are distant. The formula here is a generalized formula for, a G, uh, for the GWR model. It's very similar to a regression model with one exception where it has that annotation UI that refers to the geographical location. So why is the value of the dependent variable in, in, in that geographical location? The B coefficients are representative of the parameter estimates for each geographical location in relation to the independent variables in the model denoted by X and E is the error term. So the model specification for the GWR model is highlighted here. The model type was a continuous model, which accommodates a wide range of values, which is true of the incidence rates and the debt to case ratios of COVID-19. Uh, the continuous model also specifies that the data has to be normally distributed, which is addressed by log transforming the dependent variables. The bandwidth that was used was the number of neighbors. And this allows for neighborhood sizes to be smaller where features are dense and larger where features are sparse. The user defined number of neighbors was 100. I tried the analysis with 25 and 50 neighbors. And while there was improvements in the AIC values, it also increased local collinearity. So I settled on 100 neighbors to achieve a compromise there. Uh, the local weighting scheme here was the Gaussian weighting scheme. Uh, this weighting scheme ensures that the weights decrease smoothly and gradually away from the regression feature. It also accommodates a lot more neighbors for each regression feature and reduces local collinearity. Uh, this chart simply outlines how the GWR analysis was run. So for each dependent variable for each peak period, the analysis was run three times, one with all of the independent variables, 
the second with the age cohort variables, and the third with the comorbidity variables. In the interest of time, I will be sharing with you today the results of uh, peak period two, which is from March, uh, sorry, which is from uh, June 1st to July 31st for incidence rates and death to case ratios. Uh, so this is a summary of the incidence rates for peak period two. And the table on the top summarizes and compares the GLR or OLS regression results with that of the GWR. And the OLS regression model generated an adjusted R square 0.23. And as you can see, it has drastically improved in the GWR, GWR model with 0 0.58. And you'll also notice that the AIC values are much lower, which is a indication that the model has improved. Uh, if you look at the table at the bottom, the significance of the B coefficients um, shows that the age cohort variables, diabetes prevalence, and heart disease mortality were significant at the 95% confidence interval. This is a map showing you the standardized residuals of the GWR analysis with all of the IVs included. So a majority of the counties recorded incidence rates within about 2.5 standard deviations of the mean. High value outliers are shown in the southwestern part of the country and sporadically throughout the interior. Low value outliers are concentrated in the northeast and also in the mountain west region. This is a summary of the second dependent variable with this, which is death to case ratios for peak two. Um, in this case, you'll notice that the model fit is much weaker compared to the model for incidence rates. The GLR adjusted R square is 0 0.07. And while it has improved in the GWR model, it is still very low at 0 0.28. And in this case, there's a significant B coefficients for only the age cohort variables at the 95% confidence interval. This is the residual map for death to case ratios with all IVs included. You will notice that several counties did not record deaths. So about 37% of the counties did not record any COVID related deaths during the second peak period. Um, and you will also notice that um, the, the number of outliers are significantly lower compared to the map relating to incidence rates. There are some high value outliers sporadically distributed across the South and the Midwest and the Midwest. So in the next few slides, I'm going to share with you some coefficient rasters. The coefficient rasters display the effects of individual independent variables on COVID incidence rates and debt to case ratio. So the map on the top left is showing you the coefficients relating to incidence rates and is uh, concerned with the independent variable of age cohorts above 75. So you'll notice that positive coefficients are recorded in the Northeast, Southeast, and uh, North Central parts of the country. Whereas in the case of the debt to case ratios on the map on the lower right, the coefficients are essentially flipped. So you have positive effects on, on deaths in the Western part of the country and negative to low coefficients in the Northeast and the Southeast. So essentially what these maps are saying is that uh, counties with a high proportion of people above the age of 75, while they have a positive Im impact on incidence rates in the, in the Northeast and Southeast, they are having a low impact on deaths in those same regions. And of course, you also see the disparities in the regional disparities of both of these uh, dependent variables. Uh, this is looking at the independent variable of age cohorts between 50 to 74. And the map on the top left is the incidence rates map. And I chose a, a different color scheme for this because you'll notice that they're all negative coefficients. And the negative effects intensify in the Northeast and the North Central part of the country. And those effects are lower in the South and the Western part of the country. In terms of debt to case ratios, 
Uh, this age cohort has a, has a positive effect on deaths related to COVID in the Southeast and Midwest, but low to negative impacts in the Western part of the country. When we look at prevalence of diabetes, it is not driving incidence rates, particularly in the Midwest, but is affecting mortality in a positive way in the Midwestern region, as is seen in the lower map. In the Northeast, however, um, prevalence of diabetes is having a positive impact on incidence, but a lower impact on deaths as seen in the maps. It is also notable that diabetes prevalence has a positive effect on COVID-related deaths in the Western part of the country. Largely consistent patterns are found when it comes to the effect of obesity on increasing incidence and deaths, particularly in the South and the Midwestern parts of the country. Negative effects on both incidence rates and death to case, case ratios are observed in the Northeast. The only difference is if you look at the map on incidence rates on the top left, the Southwestern region is recording lower values in coefficients relating to this. A uh, particular independent variable. And finally, heart disease mortality rates. Uh, the map on incidence rates, they are all negative coefficients, and these uh, uh, effects intensify in the West and are much lower in the rest of the country. Heart disease mortality rates are not affecting COVID related incidence rates, but they have some varying degree of impact on death to case ratios. So the death to case ratio map suggests that counties with higher cardiovascular mortality rates are likely to experience higher COVID related deaths, particularly in the West, compared to lower COVID related deaths in the South and Southeast. In the interest of transparency, it is uh, good to highlight the limitations of the GWR model. One of the most significant of these being local collinearity. Uh, despite the efforts to uh, specify the model so that the local collinearity is minimized, it still exists, and therefore it is not good for prediction purposes. Uh, another limitation is that the transforming the dependent variables using log transformation can pose difficulties in interpreting the coefficients. Uh, the model specification, particularly the OLS regression model with the lower R square values and the varying degree of significance of the B coefficients suggests that there are other predictors that are not accounted for in the model. Uh, this provides a generalized view of the effects of age and com comorbidity on coronavirus trends. And so further uh, modifications to the model and analysis is required. So one of the key outcomes of this project is to make uh, our, our project work reproducible. And one of the main ways in which we are doing that is uh, putting together a Jupyter notebook. Uh, now, in this case, the GWR uh, analysis was run using ArcGIS software. And the ArcGIS uh, uses their own version of Python called ArcPy, which you cannot use without a license. And so therefore, uh, um, it is uh, required that I translate this code to a compatible version, which I will be working on in the next phase of the project. Um, so in, in this regard, I found a sample code from the MGWR developers website that looks something like this. And I started inputting my own variables into the code. So this is what I will be doing in the next couple of weeks to translate the code that I have to this more accessible format so that it can be uploaded to the CyberGIS platform and can be usable. Uh, in addition to coding, I will be also um, putting together metadata files that describes the data descriptions and file descriptions and data sources, and also look, uh, putting together instructional material that describes the process relating to data management and model calibration. And I think that this is important, especially to equip the user in case they want to customize the study using their own data. Uh, and so instructional materials will be put together as well and embedded in the Jupyter Notebook for easy access. 
Uh, in conclusion, I would like to thank the Geospatial Fellows Program at UIC Urbana-Champaign and for their uh, technical support team for all of their help, uh, the National Science Foundation for supporting this fellowship program, as well as the undergraduate, undergraduate students at the GeoPlace Mapping Lab at CSU Chico who assisted me with some of the data collection and the mapping. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Naomi, for that um, very interesting talk. Just to let our participants know, we will continue the program into the next talk. Feel free to type up your questions into the Q&A box for the questions targeted toward Naomi's presentation. Naomi could start responding to those questions in written form, but at the end, after finishing the second talk by uh, Dr. Kanan Lee, we will be coming together as a group to uh, have Q&A and uh, to discuss all of the questions remaining. So without further ado, let's pass the Zoom floor to uh, Kanan. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen first. Is it sharing? Perfect. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Kenan Lee, and I'm currently a research scientist at the Spatial Sciences Institute of USC. And today I'm very <coughs> pleased uh, to get the opportunity um, to talk with you about some of our uh, research fundings and uh, uh, progresses. So today, the title of my talk is The Social Determinants of Human Mobility Change Patterns and Their Impacts on Mortality and Food Insecurity. The study uh, follows the thread that social determinants uh, has some impacts on some health behaviors and the health behaviors can lead to different or disparities in health outcomes. Uh, there are many studies that have shown health outcomes are driven by many factors from uh, so-called social determinants from the uh, area like uh, economic st stability, health, ac health uh, access to healthcare, or the, uh, demographic or social economic status. And all of those variables um, has uh, been proved, uh, has impact on different kinds of health, health outcomes. This has been, uh, there has been a lot of study on environmental health, but in the realm of in, uh, epidemiology, uh, we are also very interested in the social determinants that can lead to different health behaviors. Some of the social determinants like uh, access to uh, hospitals or healthcare systems probably might not directly lead to uh, disparities in uh, human behaviors, but some of them does. And with, we are more interested to see the impacts of those social determinants that, that related with uh, human behaviors and their impacts on the disparities and inequities in health outcomes, especially during this great uh, unprecedented uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. So uh, I would like to start it from the uh, end of the thread, which is, which is the health outcomes that our research team was uh, looking at and go back to the uh, social determinants part. So uh, for the health outcomes, uh, we have been looking at two major kind of uh, outcomes. One is the mortality rate, and the other is the food insecurity that I will introduce to you in later slides. First, for the COVID-19 related deaths, uh, we have plenty of data from New York Times, uh, University of John Hopkins. However, if we want to look into details of the social disparities of those uh, mortality data, you probably need more detailed uh, mortality data uh, other than the county level data so that you can ana uh, analyze the uh, demographic characteristics or the social economic status disparities. Uh, the effort that we have been uh, sp spent on this is trying to uh, collaborate with the uh, California Department of uh, Public Health uh, to get their uh, comprehensive California comprehensive death file, which contains all the death certificates uh, during the pandemic period, and we want to use uh, and we want to use this uh, those death certificate to generate a more detailed 
uh, mortality data source so that we can using that to study the disparities uh, uh, in mortality and among different demographic groups. So the first step is trying to identify the COVID-19 related deaths. However, when we try to uh, handle this uh, challenge, we found that uh, first, let me introduce you a basic format of those uh, death certificates. Uh, two of the major uh, field that we were uh, looking at is first the cause of the death. Uh, this field uh, documents uh, so-called ICD-10 uh, code. ICD-10 code stands for International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems. It is published, it is released by WHO uh, in April 2020, uh, 2020. And it, it has, a, it, uh, I mean, the code for COVID-19 was, re was released in April 2020 and it covers almost all kind of conditions that leads to COVID-19 deaths. However, if you only relied on this field, I mean, there is a, a big disparity, disparity between the death certificate data and what we have from the public data sources, for example, the New York Times. This probably because that this ICD-10 code was only released in April and we probably missed some of the deaths in March and maybe earlier. Another, another thing is that we are using a dynamic data stream from CCD uh, so that, um, some of the uh, ICD-10 code probably uh, was not uh, completely uploaded when we were using the data stream. And at last, uh, the data that we get from those public data sources, they may not only account for the uh, direct cause of COVID-19. So we did a simple and straightforward text mining of the other fields of the death certificates. For example, uh, there are four uh, text fields in, in every single death certificates that document the in, in immediate cause of deaths and labeled A, B, C, and D. A is cause of B and B is cause of C, C is cause of D. And we try to find in those text field uh, that, uh, that uh, all of the deaths that if not direct caused by COVID-19, but uh, in immediate caused by COVID-19. So in the slide, I have a diagram shows the text mining efforts that we had uh, we had made uh, in in terms of trying to find out the uh, COVID-19 related deaths, which is uh, consistent with the public data sources. Uh, with the algorithm that I showed here, I mean, we have a result that highly matched what the numbers that we get from uh, those public data sources, uh, which included both the di direct cause from the COVID-19 and indirect cause from COVID-19. After we have a completed, uh, a completed mortality database from the uh, CCD, CCD database, uh, the next step is we try, we try to look at the disparity, disparities or the disproportionate impact on, morti on mortality rates uh, under COVID-19. The two figures I showed, you to, I showed to you here is on the left-hand side is the age standardized COVID-19 mortality rates for all ages and the selected ages by race and ethnicities. From the figure we can see, uh, first we can see that within each ethnicity group, we can clearly see the upgoing trajectory of the mortality rate over age. So this is also a proof of what we just hear about uh, Dr. Naomi Lazarus' uh, talk. I mean, um, the age of, uh, the, age of uh, the population is highly correlated with the mortality rates and uh, the higher the age, the higher the risk. However, uh, if, we, uh, if we want to uh, compare the disproportionate impacts, mortality rate ratio probably give us a more straightforward uh, results. So if we look at the mortality rate ratio on the right hand side, we can see those age standardized COVID-19 mortality rate ratios using uh, non-Hispanic whites as a reference. So we can clearly see that some of the ethnicity or race groups has higher mortality rate ratios than others. So we see the large disparities a uh, large degree of disparities here in mortality rate ratios. So this is what I just mentioned. I mean, we want to look at the disparities in the health outcomes. Uh, so, uh, I would like to show you a few more um, results in, uh, in terms of stratifying the mortality rate by other demographic variables. 
For example, if we separate, if we use the educational uh, uh, level as a stratifying variable, we can see that the, uh, the cohort with high school or less uh, uh, education, uh, educational level has more risk than the uh, cohort with some college or more. And we can also uh, look at the excess proportionate mortality, which gave us a longitudinal uh, hint about what was happening during last year. So we have, we, we do have excess proportionate mortality uh, within each subpopulation. And if we want to look at the uh, excess proportionate mortality uh, ratio, we can also see that there are some disparities uh, among some of those demographic groups. For example, if you look sex as one of the uh, demographic variable, we see if we use a uh, female as a reference, we see the EPMR, which is the excess proportionate mortality ratio is uh, 27 percentage higher than female, uh, of male than female. Uh, for race and eth ethnicity, we also see that I mean, some of the uh, as ethnic groups has uh, have much higher uh, excess um, proportionate mortality ratio than others. And we can also see the difference in educational attainments and also a big difference in birth country. Uh, we use, uh, we, we have the birth country of, uh, uh, we, we uh, dichotomize, uh, not dichotomize, we grouped the birth country of, the part of those uh, death certificates into three, uh, groups, uh, which is the United States, Mexico, and other foreign country. The, originally, we try, we try to dichotomize the groups, uh, but however, we found Mexico has a significant uh, results that we, we would like to show here. So as we can see that, I mean, we do see a lot of uh, disproportionate impacts under this COVID-19 crisis on the population in California. Another uh, health outcome we were looking at is the food insecurity. Uh, food insecurity by itself is not an outcome, but it can lead to a lot of uh, health-related uh, outcomes, I mean, a lot of um, COVID-19-related uh, health outcomes. Uh, this is, uh, the, the figures I show to you here are the results from a panel study, uh, which is a survey that uh, administrated by our research team in uh, the county of Los Angeles, and it gave us some uh, hint about the food insecurity problem in a metropolitan area as the Los Angeles County. Uh, first, if we, we, we look at the uh, first plot, I mean, which is the bar plot of the food insecurity score from April to December 2020, we can see that uh, we have a high percentage of households uh, participate in the survey that reported they were experiencing food insecurity problems. And if we break up the results into different race groups, we also see the disparities. In the middle figure, we can see that the changes in eating habit during COVID-19 pandemics um, I mean, uh, su surprisingly, we see that like over a half of the population has uh, some degree of change of their healthy diet uh, and uh, their uh, cooking habits. For example, we see that uh, more 51 oh, percentage of the um, participants reported they were doing more than before uh, in making home cooked meals. At last uh, is the uh, something about obesity. I mean, this is something that I just uh, I, I, what I mentioned before. I mean, food insecurity could lead to some kind of health outcomes. I mean, uh, this report shows us um, thirty eight percentage of the participants reported gaining weight uh, during the COVID nineteen pandemic. And personally, I would self evaluate myself uh, is belong to this uh, this part of uh, cohort. Uh, I mean, uh, under the shelter in place uh, guidelines by the government of uh, uh, Los Angeles, uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of gyms and workout places was closed, and so people were losing opportunities to participate uh, in those uh, working hours, and also they uh, uh, had some changes in their diet, as I just showed in the middle figure. So that is a summary of the food insecurity from. Uh, Panel study that our research group has uh, conducted. So now let's look at the disparities uh, in the different demographic groups. Uh, 
uh, we can clearly see the disparities in uh, if, if we stratify the results by different demographic variables. For example, we see more female uh, was reporting food insecurity than males. And we also see that the uh, food insecurity problems was more experienced by the younger age population um, under 40, year, 40 years old. And we also see the, the uh, disparities uh, among those uh, among those race groups. And we also see social economic status. I mean, the economic status is also a key part in determining the uh, risk of food insecurity. I mean, low-income population has uh, higher risks as shown in this bar plots. And uh, we also uh, comparing uh, this report uh, longitudinally with previous years in order to understand the changes of the distributions of those disparities. And uh, uh, the result is uh, on the right-hand side, we can see, just, even though we see some smaller changes, but I would like to say, I mean, those disparities, uh, the distribution of the disparities follows the historical trend of the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, of whatever the uh, demographic or socioeconomic variables we choose to hear. So besides of the panel, panel study, I mean, uh, for the, uh, even though for the uh, survey, we were trying to design it as sci scientific as possible to uh, cover uh, unbalanced, uh, uh, to cover a very balanced uh, data sample. However, it is just a survey and it just covered over 1000 population of uh, metropolitan area, which is not big enough to get a better understanding of the actual situation of the food environment or food ecosystem of the uh, uh, whole Los Angeles County area, we probably need to uh, seek support from other data sources. For example, USDA Food Access uh, Research Atlas indicators has some uh, variables um, that can help us to identify some LA County food deserts. Um, and did those data from 2015, those food desert, desert errors were uh, identified by looking at the low income and the low access to uh, food, uh, to food uh, <clears throat> uh, resources. Uh, also, besides of uh, those data, we also has a collaboration with a company called Aunt Bertha, which shared us a completed databases about all of the nonprofit and social care providers and their programs under COVID-19 last year in the Los Angeles County so that we can further looking at the coverage of those social care programs and the uh, spatial distributions and get a better understanding of the food insecurity of the whole area. Another data source that our research team has uh, been working with is that we have a collaboration with the Yelp uh, company, uh, which offered us a uh, more completed list of the food related business in the study area. Um, we uh, traditionally, I mean, we, if we you want to look at food related business, you can search help, you can seek help from the uh, NAICS code, which is the North American Industry Classification System codes. They are the code that uh, of the uh, business that uh, register, when the business register the primary uh, commercial type. How, uh, and you can extract those food-related types to get the food-related business. However, uh, we found that Yelp dataset offered us a much more completed uh, view of the food ecosystems other than just look at those uh, registered uh, food-related business because uh, most of time you have like uh, food trucks or some corner shop uh, or a convenience shop, or maybe gas station even sell food. So uh, Yelp, uh, from the Yelp data set, we have a better view of uh, the entire food ecosystem of the whole area county. And besides of that, Yelp data set also uh, offered us the amenity variables of those uh, food related business. For example, uh, any uh, protocols during the uh, pandemic period, do they offer uh, outside dining area or things like that. So a lot of variables that we can use to analysis the, uh, uh, the disparities of the uh, food insecurity during 
at the pandemic period. And we also have the operation hours and the business closures from the Yelp data set. Uh, for example, if we look at the curve here, we can see that there is a big wave of the business closure during the uh, beginning at beginning of the pandemic period. I mean, starting in March 2020, we see a lot of local business that uh, closed uh, after right after the shelter in place order and the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic. And we see that this tapered down uh, later and as the LA County moves towards uh, uh, later stage, stages of the uh, pandemic uh, protocols. Okay, so not now uh, after we talk about the outcomes, now let's look at the uh, mobility, uh, now let's look at the uh, health behavior related variables. So, um, just like I mentioned, I mean, uh, there are a lot of social determinants that can cause the disparities of the of the outcomes uh, during this pandemic period, but some of them are more uh, of our interest because they are more related with human behaviors, especially if we're looking at this problem in an epidemiology way, I mean, the human behavior plays an important role in the spread of the uh, virus. So uh, human mobility is one of the great example that, uh, uh, that we can use um, to, uh, as a proxy to uh, those human behaviors because during the last year we have, seen, we have seen so many companies has released open data source about human mobility. I just would like to list a few of the important ones here and uh, mention uh, some, some, uh, some differences about our data sources. I mean, uh, technically, all of those mobility uh, data relied on the location surveys of the smart devices, but, but some of the variables will not directly calculate from the uh, locations of devices. For example, uh, Google has their Google Community Mobility Reports at county level, and this variable is calculated by, their lo by the location history of their user accounts. So it is not necessarily equals to the device, the locations of the devices. It is one, it is wherever the user choose to log onto their uh, Google account. And the variable they offered to the public is like, uh, the changes of uh, those uh, 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 logins uh, in certain type of areas, such as retail areas, recreational areas, transit stations, and so on. Another type of data we can get is from the uh, Apple or Uber uh, companies. For example, Apple mobility trend reports also uh, in uh, sub-region or city level are in um, <coughs> offered us the navigation searches in the Apple map. So this, this is also not the actual uh, location of the device, but it is the uh, uh, navigation uh, usage of their uh, Apple map. So we'll, but anyway, so this is also a proxy, a good proxy of uh, human mobility that we can use to indicate the human behavior during this uh, uh, period. Uh, at last, we have some data sources that uh, generate variables directly from the location of the devices using the cell phone pins and their interactions with the uh, base tower, uh, the base stations or cell phone towers and using the triangulation algorithm to get the locations. So uh, we don't have the uh, individual level um, data, but we have some a lot of variables that uh, they, those company released. Uh, <coughs> For example, the percentage of completely staying at home devices or the median home dwelling times and so on. Uh, the, the major data source that our team was looking at is the safe graph data because it granted us the most uh, finest uh, res uh, spatial resolution at sen uh, sensors block group scale. So I listed all the variables that offered from safe graph that we can use as proxies to human mobility. Uh, in studying and or modeling the uh, COVID-19 uh, spread. Uh, it has four categories. So the first category is uh, the travel is re, uh, depending on the travel distance. And the second category is uh, 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 different uh, counts of their devices. And they also offer the third category is about the destination of the devices. And the last is the home dwelling times. Uh, I highlighted the variable uh, in, uh, 
that can be stratified by certain means. For example, you can have the number of devices stratified by the range of uh, distances, or you can have the number of devices stratified by hour or hours of the day. So those are the variables that, that we can look at. However, in order to get getting insights of those variables, we, we are facing a big challenges. On the left-hand side, we have a figure that shows, that looks like making nonsense because, I mean, that's not convey any information to you. However, this is all of the residential sensors. Uh, this is the median home dwelling time curves of all the residential uh, census block groups in the Los Angeles areas. So this is only for, uh, for LA County. And I already removed all of the non-residential areas and we can see, still see the high spatial variation of those curves. So, um, so I mean, the, uh, the information I want to pass, pass here is that by using a mean value or median value or even a population weighted mean value of those uh, high variated curves probably is not uh, representable to study the uh, human mobility in a finer scale. So uh, talking about getting uh, the methodologies of getting the information from those complex, uh, noisy time series, we, uh, our team has uh, work, been working on two types of methodologies. The first is about time series clustering. We're comparing the time series clustering methods and we uh, found that self-organizing map is one of the uh, highest performance uh, algorithm that can granted us the most, uh, uh, the, the smallest within group uh, clusters and among, uh, largest among group clusters. However, the traditional SOM self-organizing uh, map is very, um, uh, does, uh, I mean, it's very weak at handle the time dependence of time series data. And especially in this case, if we look at the figure here, this figure shows us uh, the situation of the uh, uh, percentage of full-time work behavior devices in California for 2019 and 2020. Blue lines, 2020 time series and the orange line, 2019. Um, we can see a very strong weekly pattern of those time series. And this is very, uh, uh, understandable because I mean full-time working behavior devices probably will have a big job during week weekends. However, the, the, those time dependence give us a big challenges in correctly using the uh, SOM uh, or other time series clustering uh, method because we have so many local noises in in uh, in doing the clustering methods. So we propose a dynamic time warping algorithm by using the dynamic dynamic time warping measurements as a, uh, I mean, as a reference in training the uh, SOM neural network and we, it, gains, uh, it, gain, uh, it gave us uh, better results in classifying those uh, time series. Another, another uh, methodology we're trying to uh, look at is called shapeless method. I mean, just, uh, just like uh, I said, I mean, we see a lot of noises in those time series. So some of the time we might not be interested in the whole time series. We might, we might only be interested in some uh, local clip of the time series. For example, after the shelter in place, uh, order has been released by our government. Some places with high degree of political compliance may have a sharp increase of home dwelling time and some of the places may not. So in order to better extract those, uh, uh, those uh, sim symbol, symbolized uh, short clip of the time series, um, parts. So we propose this uh, shapeless finding algorithms. So due to the time limitation, I would like to skip the details about how we, we use the wavelet transformation and its scalagram to guide the new deep learning neural network in finding the uh, short time ship, uh, short, uh, short period uh, shapeless of the time series. Uh, now let us look at some of the results uh, that we have. Uh, in this figure, I would like to show you the uh, DTM SOM uh, groups of the daily median home dwelling time uh, of, the, of the state of California. On the left-hand side, we can see nine types of uh, mobility curves, and we can see the locations of those uh, mobility patterns uh, of the state of California on the, of, on the map on the uh, right-hand side. So 
uh, from the, those curves are changes by uh, subtract the values uh, of uh, 2019 from the 2020. So if it is positive, it means that it has a gaining of the daily median home dwelling time. If it is negative, we see it is, it is a losing of the home dwelling time. Uh, for example, if we look at group five, we can see that it, it has it is the most populated group uh, in this clustering uh, algorithm. And we can see that it follows what we would normally imagine of the hu human response after a shelter in place order was released because, I mean, we see a sharp increase of the median home dwelling time. And then we see a gradual decrease when the order was uh, um, weakened by stage by stage. However, this is not uh, <clears throat> this. This is not all the information we, we get from here. We do see some of the counties and uh, some of the block groups that has uh, negative values all the time and doesn't doesn't make any changes. I mean, yeah, during the uh, uh, release of the shelter in place order. So we would like to say uh, they have like relatively low political compliance to the orders. So we see a lot of patterns here during, during the time limitation. I would not explain them one by one, but we but the information I would like to convey here is that we do see uh, the disparities in the uh, in the patterns. So the last slide, I would like to show you the uh, uh, disparities, uh, I mean, in, in a quantity way. First, from the ANOVA test, we can see all the F values is a large standard criterion. And I didn't, uh, due to the uh, um, space of the layout of this slide, I, uh, I ruled out the uh, P values, but they are all smaller than 0.01. And on the right-hand side, we can see, uh, I use the linear discriminant analysis to find the directions of those impact of the, those variables, the impacts of those variables on some of the mobility groups. And as we can see, some of the variables that has a very high impacts on the groups. So which kind of patterns that those human behavior groups, a certain census block group should belong to. At last, we are currently uh, working with the uh, Cyber uh, JSX, which is a cyber infrastructure platform that allow us to uh, publish and uh, our work in a more transparent and reproducible way. Because the, most of the algorithms and the data sources that I talked about relies on high performance of the computational uh, clusters and also a very uh, specific settings of the running environments. And for example, the libraries you need to include it. Uh, so cyber infrastructure gave us a very good opportunity to uh, uh, make the work uh, reproducible and shareable with others. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank the opportunities here. So this is the end of my talk. And again, I would like to thank the opportunity that uh, UIUC uh, provided us, uh, the Geospatial Fellows, in uh, sharing uh, our um, researches with, uh, with you. OK, so if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. Thanks very much, Conan, for um, that very interesting talk. Now. We would like to open the floor and invite questions. I saw we have a few um, Q&A already happened in the Q&A box. Now, if uh, you have any further questions, um, please feel free to um, ask them. And uh, we'll have both uh, Dr. Lazarus and me uh, speak to um, uh, to your your questions and uh, and I hope to engage interactions. We don't have a couple of minutes left, but uh, I think our speakers will stay on. Uh, and if you want to stay on, feel free to do so. And uh, happy to have a productive conversation. Uh, first, maybe just to uh, ask uh, Naomi, uh, you had a few responses to um, Dr. Mike Gutschow's question. Uh, do you want to follow up and uh, clarify? Naomi? Uh, yeah, I, I did mention that um, the, uh, the use of GWR is mostly to look at a, a generalized understanding of how 
comorbidities, comorbidities and age are playing out at the county level. And it's, it's probably not good for predictive purposes and, and to administer causality, which, you know, I'm, I apologize if there was a misunderstanding there, but um, I think it was mostly to look at the spatial effects of county level uh, impacts of age and comorbidity. And it's not mostly, when we look at the coal, uh, local collinearity, it's highly co uh, there's a lot of collinearity going on. So it might not be the best model for predictive purposes. Yeah, if I understand the question from Mike correctly, uh, I think the focus of this question is uh, about uh, the appropriate aspect from the DWR modeling to address the causal aspects uh, because of uh, purpose as the DWR applied to your problem is really to assess correlations as opposed to causality. Right. So I think the title of your work and maybe some parts of your right. uh, moving uh, in that causality aspect, which he questioned. Uh, now, if um, I understand your response correctly, uh, you agree with him that this is a correlation as, as opposed to causality. Right, correct. Thank you. Any other questions? There is one other question in the Q&A box uh, for Keenan. Keenan, can you take that? Sure. Uh, did you expect to see more spatial clustering in the SOM results in California? Uh, the result that I just showed is the uh, is the, I mean, a result of uh, California. Uh, however, I, I, I do agree that uh, right now, I mean, just uh, showing nine patterns of the, uh, I mean, of the, of the complex uh, ground truth that, I, that we had from the mobility data is not enough. So the uh, trade-off is that the more clustering, uh, uh, the more clustering groups that we have, I mean, the more accurate that our, our uh, algorithms would be. However, it will also leave us uh, difficulty about how to interpret each one of them because we are not just uh, want to explore the different types of mobility patterns, but we also want to uh, uh, try to interpret the social determinants of those patterns and the directions of impacts of those, those social determinants. So uh, we choose nine groups right now, is, which is a trade-off of the two factors I just mentioned. So, uh, uh, and we are uh, in getting further details of those, uh, of the, all, all the possible underlying information of the mobility data. Uh, I, we are also interested in, in uh, mining the local patterns of uh, those human mobility uh, time series, which is something that we are still working on. Are there any open questions? Uh, maybe there's one more, right? Or Okay, so I'm going to take a turn here, since we don't have open questions in the Q&A box, to uh, ask something to Conan. Uh, thanks again for your interesting talk today. Uh, in the past several Geospatial Fellow webinars, we had some related work to what you're doing here related to uh, your human mobility uh, analysis. Uh, given that the data sources we had from the other fellows, you know, the noisy aspects and also the geographical granularity aspects. I was wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit about your uncertainty quantification in your analysis and what are the implications from the uncertainty we have to deal with in terms of your social determinants uh, findings. Uh, so how, how you would assess uh, that uh, linkage. Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. 
So uh, yes, we do have uh, some related work that uh, from our uh, brilliant fellows in the previous webinar series. Uh, so first in, uh, I mean, um, in connecting with those kind of works, I mean, uh, 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 I, I, in, so I mean, we have we 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 have we have we have some uh, fellows working on the bottom up approaches in modeling the uh, in modeling the spread of the uh, pandemic. Uh, of, of, I mean, of the virus, and we have some uh, someone looking at the I mean spatial uh, distribution and the uncertainty of the variables. So I think uh, into in getting the details of those uh, you know finer uh, granularity will allow us to be able to uh, getting some features of those. For example, if you want to do bottom up uh, bottom up work, I mean to getting the uh, you, you, you need the data I mean of the of the attribute to set up the attributes of those, those bottom up uh, units and uh, for the uh, mm, so uh, for the uh, uncertainty part of the data I would like to say that uh, that is something that we we can include it in the I mean in the when we're trying to do the modeling approach. Thank you. It sounds like that's part of your future work. Yes, uh, yes, that, that, yeah, that, yeah, that's some, some part of the future work that we have actually looking at. I mean, uh, because I mean, uncertainty related to I mean, the modeling approaches, and we are we do are very interested in uh, using uh, the current finding in gui in guiding the modeling approaches, even uh, no matter if it is a SEIR model, I mean, or a bottom up approach. So I mean, while we're trying to actually using those kind of patterns that we discovered from the uh, mobility data. I mean, uh, I think, I mean, uncertainty is one of the major problems that we need to consider uh, in do the actual model. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, yeah, we are six minutes beyond what we budgeted for the webinar today. Uh, I think for the participants still around, Maybe Colleen, you could help promote our participants into uh, also uh, panelists as a as an entire group. See if uh, folks want to directly speak with each other. There is one other question from Joe, um, I guess in the in the Q and A box for Kinan. Mm, uh, let me take a look. Okay, so that's a very good question as well. Uh, let me show my uh, map here in order to better answer a question. Okay, so yeah. Before you start, I will pause the recording so that any um, participants uh, who want to use their camera feel uh, feel free to do so. Is that okay? Yes. Sounds great to me. <laughs> 